and both sides of the family. You say something yeah. about your father's side and your mother's side and your origins and all that. Right, so, okay, no problem. Uh, my name is John Young. Uh, I'm from Abbeyside and Dungarvan. And in 1948, I was born in a little street in Dungarvan called the Long Row. And uh, I was shipped over to Murphy Place then when I was two with Mam and Dad. And Dad was from Abbeyside. Mam was from town, originally from on Shannapobble, Old Parish. And Mam's name was McGrath, and uh, Dad was Michael Young. And uh, he worked in the local tannery, he did. And he worked there with seven or eight hundred, uh, 700 odd uh, men in the tannery. Uh, they worked very hard in, uh, just down where we're sitting now. And they made a letter for the boots for the armies of, the, of the, the Europe, and really, and they really worked hard. It was a dirty old job. But uh, all my family on my father's side are from Abbey's side, very involved with the sea. Uh, my grandfather, Michael George Young, and his brother John Joe, they, both of those were on a ship called the Lady Bell on the 26th of March 1941, just off of Bristol. And a German bomber came along, and even though ERA was wrote on either side of the ship, uh, none of the Luftwaffe went to Irish classes, <laughs> so he dropped three bombs. One on the port side, one on the starboard side. The third bomb went through the handrail. The explosive part of it in the front of it went out into the sea. I have the tail of the bomb delivered by airmail uh, on top of the Lady Bell, and uh, I have it at home in my workshop. Now, uh, the skipper on that day was Captain Tom Donoghue. Tom Donoghue was uh, one of the most famous mariners in uh, the annals of Irish uh, maritime history. Tom was bombed, torpedoed, right, by the, the Germans. He was bombed by the Luftwaffe and he was sunk in the Atlantic. He was with Irish shipping and he was picked up by another uh, uh, ship as well of the fleet. And after that, Tom was with uh, the Stafford uh, Shipping Company in Wexford on a ship called the Carlo. It was a very small ship, small coaster, and they were on their way up through the Bay of Biscay. And lo and behold, another German plane started circling. And he said, here we go again. So it, they signaled to the ship to go back. Evidently, what had happened, there was a huge sea battle in the Bay of Biscay. The Royal Navy plastered the Germans that trapped them. Thousands of men died in the cold, and uh, they were actually picked up, 168 and picked up by Captain Tom Donoghue and the crew of the Carlogue of Wexford. And like old Nelson, he turned a blind eye. His Navy cert or license told him he had to, go and deliver them to Milford Haven in Wales and the Royal Navy or the British authorities were ringing him and radioing him every half an hour and he pretended he couldn't hear him. He landed them on New Year's Day in um, Cove. Uh, three or four of them died, they were put out from more, uh, we say burns and stuff like that and so, uh, two of them were buried at sea and more of them then were buried in Kil uh, Glencree in Wicklow, in the, in the uh, German War Cemetery in Wicklow. Tom was awarded a cup by Herr Himmler in grateful thanks to her German na uh, nation for saving all the sailors. In actual fact, they could have taken over his ship. There was, it was so crowded he had to uh, point out and give instructions. He didn't speak German and he didn't speak English. And they landed in Cove. And they all spent a happy war in the Curragh. And I actually have the actual drawings that were done in pen and pencil by the inmates. And they were out cutting turf and they were out dancing. They went to the pictures every Sunday night or Saturday night. And two of them married Irish girls. And Tom was buried over in the churchyard there in Abbeyside. Uh, He's at rest now about 50 hours away from the sea. 
You know, it was really poignant that he would be buried so close to the water. He lived his life there. He died in 1949. And, and John, you also said that <coughs> Dungarvan and Abbeyside was a major fishing community. Precisely. It, it was. I'll explain to you about it. Uh, going back to the early 1800s, Dungarvan was synonymous with hake. And hake was so plentiful that one man could pull in 1,100 fish with a hand line in one night, right? In actual fact, hake was so plentiful that the farming community, they used it as fertilizer on the land. Now, if you go at the moment and you go into a restaurant or a supermarket or whatever fish shop and you ask for a nice bit of hake, you'd want to be a ring in the bank, <laughs> sure, because it is quiet. Um, you know, expensive now. But uh, Dungarvan is synonymous with fishing and uh, another part of it as well, uh, there's a great affinity between here and Talavanishk, Newfoundland. Just outside the door where we're doing the interview now, in 1815, a little boy of 15 years of age, James Power. He jumped on board uh, an outward uh, bound uh, schooner from Dungarvan or Abbeyside, I better mention Abbeyside because it's a special place in my heart as well as Dungarvan. But James went away, he knew nobody in uh, Talavanishk and uh, he went to the cod trade and he worked his way up. I met a descendant of James four or five years ago in the hotel up the street. He's now the governor of um, Newfoundland. So like uh, they all have Waterford accents. Uh, you have Whelans there and Currens there, Welshes and Powers, and due to their remoteness, they retained the Waterford uh, slang words. You know, like uh, like you know, they probably hadn't blaze out there now. But you know, you would if you met one of them outside the door there, you'd never know the difference that they've been away for two hundred years. Yeah, yeah. Did you say it was like three thousand people? Yeah, in 1831, the fishery was so good at the time. 3,000 people were involved in the fisheries, and I, I'll explain it to you. You had the people boat building, you had the fishermen then themselves, and you had the women involved in the curing uh, uh, process as well. And you had people making barrels, you had coopers, and in actual fact, there's a street in the town called Buttery Lane or Buttery Street, and in Dungarvan or Dadesha, you'll always uh, hear, hey, uh, you've got a boat of spuds from a farmer or whatever. That's an old measurement. And what they've done is they made barrels, like uh, whiskey barrels you now, and they cut them in half. And it was a measurement of how you measure or weighed uh, herrings or fish, and that was known as a boat. And uh, you had other uh, people in the industry as well. You had the cures, you had the net makers, you had all these uh, trades, you had people making clothing for them as well, sail makers, rope makers. We had two or three rope makers here in Dungarvan. Uh, you had one going down by the uh, St Mary's Catholic Church and you had another one in O'Connell Street. And they'd be working at the hemp, you know, the whole time. A uh, very laborious job, but all these ropes, they were all used, you know, in the local uh, area here. And it was a skilled trade as well. Then you had shipbuilding. And, you know, Dungarvan is really um, one of the, it was a, the hub for the south coast of Ireland for transatlantic uh, trade as well. Just even our next door neighbours over in Wales there and in England and Scotland, uh, the Welsh coal, where we're actually sitting now. This was a coal yard and this uh, building here was owned by Captain Kern. And Michael Kern and his sister Kathleen they were the owners of it when I was young. And uh, this yard here was the coal yard. And it's a very historic place that we're sitting in now. During the American Civil War, Captain Richard Curran, he loaded up his ship with guns and ammunition at Le Havre in France. And he sailed across the Atlantic and he got in past the northern blockade. And he got into New Orleans, sold his uh, cargo and the ammunition as well, the whole lot, to the Confederate Army. And they came back here to this house here. It's a very old, there's a lovely feeling when you come into these places here. Because you're walking in the footsteps of our ancestors. 
Now, going back to my mother's side, my mother was Nellie McGrath, and uh, she was from Golan in Old Parish, baptised in uh, Ring Church. And um, my grandfather was on, a hundred years ago this year, he was on the Kylie's Cross tug of war team. And they cycled from Kylie's Cross, it's only just 10 miles, 15 miles out the road. They cycled to Cork, pulled the best in Ireland, and cycled home. Now, you had no sponsorship from big brewing companies or cigarette companies. They cycled on their bikes. They came back, you had no tracksuits or anything like that, but they had big hobnelbows and they had big lovings like myself, like, you know. This is the 100th anniversary of the Kylie's Cross all Ireland tug of war team beating the rest of Ireland. Now, and they came back, and do you know what they had? A couple of large bottles and a game of cards. They were very humble people. And the last of them uh, was a Fitzgerald man who actually only died about uh, 20 years ago. And they were big, big, strong men, you know. Fair order, as they say, you know, so they are. Yeah. Can you, John, can you just remember, you know, when you were saying you, you came over here when you were very young, like two or three years of age? Yeah. What's your early memories of running around on Well, I'll tell you, Abbey Side would have been my earliest. Uh, We lived in Murphy Place, and it was a council estate, and um, you had wonderful characters uh, going around. And I must tell you this story, because I bring uh, school groups around on little tours and things like that. And just over near Shell Cottage on Abbey Side, there was a small incline up along the road. Now, before global warming, (laughs) every evening we'd pour water on a smooth surface in the street, in Cher Street, and it would freeze. And we had the best skating rink in Ireland, but there was one old lady there, I sp- we couldn't understand why she'd done it, but we were probably a pain to butt her, and she put ashes on it. And we were flying down the lawn, and we nearly all got killed. We just, we absolutely hated that uh, lady, but, you know, we, we were doing no harm. And in those days, you must remember, when I was small, there were no cares. I remember Father Roach, he had a Morris Minor care with the two uh, indicators coming out the side of the care like that. And the number of the care was KI5215. And he'd actually back it out and he'd hit the curve on the, uh, near the ball. And the next thing he'd go forward then again. And he was a lovely, lovely old man. And, you know, I, rem- I often remember now uh, all the old sailors there, Captain Higgins and big you know, coats and big hats and big uh, moustaches and they all burnt with tobacco and stuff like that. And the wonderful times we had down on the pond in Abbeyside. Patching organ, you had Patching organ and you had Matty organ, right? And they used, uh, Patching used, I always remember, he was a lovely, lovely man and we learned so much from these people. He used to get a plug of tobacco and he had a special knife and then he'd be rubbing away and he'd be kind of humming and whistling away and he'd be rubbing it. And the smell to us, it was nectar, really. It was beautiful. And he used to put it in his pipe and he had a kind of a silvery top on it uh, um, to stop the draft or whatever. And we'd always be sitting down next to Patchine and we'd be watching all the old fishermen and they'd tell yarns and stuff like that. And my dad collected a lot of stuff that they, they recited. Uh, Bill Murray, they all sailed all over the world. They went to were deep water men as well. They went around Cape Horn. Uh, some of them saw life in the raw, and more of them they just survived. And uh, as I say, it was, um, it was very easy in the ponds, as we call it over there. Our school was just behind us. It was built in 1891. And we had the most wonderful, wonderful teachers. And you went uh, to school over, over the pond, yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll always rem- remember uh, Mrs. O'Mahony and Mr. Foley, Mr. McHugh. And uh, what they used to do, th- there were two classes in the one room, and all the boys were in one place, and they, all the girls were in the next uh, part of it, the girls' school. And if you were in early in the morning, you were lucky especially in the winter's morn, there was a big roaring turf fire. And if you were down the back, if you got a wetting, and I must tell you about my first day in school. Ma'am, you, uh, all the women, they were brilliant. They could knit, sew, stitch. My father done our shoes. Uh, I have dad's last at home, shoe last. 
right? And I use it as a doorstop now. And if he saw me now, he'd kill me because it was his pride and joy. But I remember Mam actually uh, knit a beautiful red fold over pullover, red like my own one now, right? Okay. And a lovely white shirt and short pants. And down I went and got to school for my very first day, and I was go. I was told these are going to be the d- best days of your life. I decided only after an hour I had enough, <laughs> and I made a run. I did, <laughs> and I ran up the road, and there was a, a deluge of rain. There was a thunderstorm, and I came up home. Now we only lived about 300 yards <laughs> up the road, but the shirt was gone pink. And the pullover was starting to fade. <laughs> and I was frog marched down the road again into school. You know, it was um, one of those uh, memories that I'll always retain. And I must say that a, a beautiful memory I have of my godmother, who was Damien Gagan's uh, mum, right? And she used to come over and we sat around our range at home in the kitchen, small range. And they'd done wonderful baking and cooking and... Everything seemed to be better and taste better when you were young, maybe four, five, six. But Annette, I'll always remember she came over one Christmas and she gave me 10 shillings. Now for the modern people, this is 50p, you know. Uh, there was 120 pence in, in that. And I went off into, uh, out into Christie Power Shop next to the Scouts Den. That was our you know, Mecca, like, you know, it was magical looking in the window there, and especially at Christmas. And I bought licorice, fizz bags, and blackjacks, and boy, was I fizzing. <laughs> I was as sick as a parrot for two days. But I'll always remember Annette coming over at Christmas and my godfather, James E. Manny. And I, I, I meet Annette now regularly. She's, she's a lovely, lovely lady, and I'm proud she's my godmother. Now, yeah. Do you remember, we say, running around Grand Square as it was then? Like, would you, would you remember things like the fairs and all that? I do. I remember now coming into town on the third Wednesday of the month, and all the farmers would be in early. And this is something that the younger generation are not au fait with or aware of, yes, they never saw it. I remember from early morning, you'd hear, just up the road from our house in Abbeyside, You'd hear the cattle moving, coming in the Waterford Road, coming in from Clane, you know, like that, coming in there, all along there. And the farmers and the men in the dark and they'd move them along. And they'd have to uh, put them on the square then, and they'd be there, and they could be there for a whole day, and they mightn't sell them, and they might have to bring them home again. But, you know, it was a very hard, very hard lifestyle for you know the farming community and people don't realize what the, the hardships they went through like you could be standing in the rain and you could be freezing cold now and often you you could get a few bob mind in a couple of cows for a farmer he'd be gone in for a bottle to you know tommy powers or into any of the pubs nicky cases in the square and like that's the only way you get a bit of pocket money Right. But I saw the square after the fair, and it was a great man called Jimmy Neen Power, Jimmy Power from Lockmoor. Right. He'd get a big hose, and he'd hose the whole square. Now, um, the cows were and the cattle weren't potty trained, right? And it, it would be open doors and steps and everything. And Jimmy would have the whole square shining. Right, okay. Now, I'll always remember that, and uh, there's, there are lovely photographs in Tom Tobin's book, Echoes of the Dacia, of Jimmy washing down the bank. Now, a lot of the banks, you know, with, with the way things have been the last few years, they could have done with a good wash, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you are. But I, I tell you what, um, these are little memories that come back to me, and Dan Fraher's Corner in the square. Now, that, that is a special place in the history of everyone from the Dacia. Dan Fryer was a wonderful athlete. He came in from Raina Down Pond, and the Fahrach is still there, the Rune is still there, but he was way ahead of his time. He actually uh, had the field named after him, Fraher Field, and um, he was a wonderful, wonderful, um, shall we say, a person that uh, respected Irish culture and language. Uh, his, the, the name over his shop was the Gaelic Outfit and Store. 
And in the last two years, when the square was all being renovated there, and um, they took away a small little panel, and lo and behold, Osquelga, Dan's name is on the in the on tiles. That hasn't been seen for many, many years. Now I never remember, right? Okay, and. It was a wonderful place to meet your, your future wife or boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever uh, the gender would be. Um, in Dublin, you had Cleary's Clock, right? Okay, but in Dungarvan, we had Dan Fraher's Corner. And you'd meet her there and you'd be peeping to see where she there or he'd, she'd be peeping to see where you there to go to the pictures or go to, to a dance or something like that. And, you know, it was one of these places that is um, special to the people of the, of the area. Now, another thing you mentioned there about the square. Um, when we were all young kids over Murphy Place, um, the Corpus Christi procession. Now, for the younger generation watching this interview, uh, we, we didn't have uh, long pencils. I was 15 when I got a corduroy pencil and a pair of galluses. Yeah. The sprays is now to the younger generation. And, You'd kneel in the square in the summertime in the, you know, the Corpus Christi, and you'd be stuck onto the square. Tear. Everyone detested kneeling in the square. And you'd be looking for a bit of a newspaper or a bit of cardboard, and, you know, like that, to, um, just to protect you. Because it's a devil to try and get a tear off your knees. And the women hated it, so there you are. But these are little memories of the square. How many public meetings there? There was a, a big, huge public meeting there uh, five weeks before Michael Collins was killed at Bail and Blow. And Michael was addressing the people of the Dacia for the very last time. And he was on the back of a lorry. And the town council, the clergy and the press were on board. But one of the old IRA jumped in, anti-treaty, jumped in and took off with the lorry with her town council, the press and the clergy on board. And Michael's bodyguard stuck a, a gun in the, w in the window and he told him to stop or he'd uh, shoot him. He kept going over the bridge, capsized the lorry on the causeway, just up the street from where we are now. The entourage fell off the lorry and you know, nobody was badly injured. Michael Collins returned to where Lawler's Hotel is now, and there's a beautiful balcony, an iron, uh, beautiful cast iron balcony, with the Duke of Devonshire's uh, motto, uh, family motto, or crest in it. And for the very last time, Michael Collins spoke to the people of the Dacia, five weeks before he died. Now, that's a lovely story, and uh, like, it happened, you know, on, uh, uh, in modern history. I don't know whether it be for sports or for politics. Yeah. Square, big, big oh, I'll tell you about sports now. Like, I don't really go into politics. But I'll tell you, 1959, we had a wonderful uh, uh, hurling team. We still have a wonderful hurling team, but this Lee McCarthy, them Cork crowd, they seem to be kind of codding us over the last few years and Kilkenny. I remember 1959 being on the square and opened the pond in, in Abbeyside, right? Now, the pond to us was like Trafalgar Square. It was our playground, it was everything to us. And we, we um, I remember uh, bonfires blazing when we were, I was uh, 11 then, and uh, Austin Flynn, he was, he was our hero, he was my hero anyway, and he holding the cup up. Duck Whedon, uh, I can name them all, you know, as they are. But I saw people, you know, with joy in their hearts well, uh, there, in, in the square, and over the pond episode. It was lovely. Now we've had the minor teams, they've won as well, and Warford are coming on, uh, steady as they go, but hopefully we'll hold Lee McCarthy up in the square. Lacoon of the August and Wyden Borough, and we, if the car crowd would give us an old chance there, they might, you know, we'd be all right. I can you mentioned uh, yeah. Going to cinema and going to dances. Yeah. Can you tell us any stories about that from growing up? I can. Uh, years and years ago in John Garvin, things were so strict at the dances. For the modern generation watching this uh, interview now, there was one man in the town hall, he used to use a ruler, and you couldn't go any near than 12 inches to your partner. It was very petite and, you know, proper. And if you were bold, you were thrown out of the town hall. 
right? But I'll always remember um, going to the town hall. It's where I met my wife. We're 47 years together this year, in the 4th of August. And uh, Engelbert Thumper, I think, have a lot to answer for. I went to the dance and I, I saw her and went over and asked her out. The last waltz with you, Engelbert Thumper, I think, was singing that. And I'm still with her. Nobody else will have me. Speaking of music, you mentioned the story you on to me about the... Uh Scottish trawlers. Yes, oh, I'll explain to you about that. It's so funny. Um, the Scottish trawlers used to come in here in the 50s, right? And they used to just fish for herrings. Everything else was just waste. And I'll always remember going over now, all the last marketplace we went over. Now, as I told you previously before the interview, there were no plastic bags in our day, right? So you had to go get the, ne- the next best thing. A shoe box from Benny Murphy up in Delaney's shoe shop. And you filled it with lemon sole and you had whiting and all oh, the best of fish. That was waste to them. And I'll always remember listening to Cilla Black, um, the, the, all the top, uh, Cliff Richards, Elvis Presley, all the top bands at the time in the early, uh, we said the late 50s, early 60s. And at her in our house at home, it was Radio Ern. And at 10 o'clock, my grandmother, who you, you swear a shawl, Bridge Manny, she, she was a married to an old parish man, a shawl. And I'll always remember, here, here is the BBC home service, here's the news, and she winding the clock, and you hear Big Ben, and she give it, and then she'd wind again, and off to bed then, no tellies, right? And I tell you, often I wonder, <laughs> were we better off with just what we had? But it was a very simple... But you got the music on the... Music. Oh, we did. We got all the, the music, all the songs. We knew them all. Where was that, the Scottish? Uh, on Radio Luxembourg, the station out the stairs from Kingsham in Bristol. Yeah. Horace Batchelor was the man presented. And uh, he was a wonderful guy. Everyone knew him. And then we had Radio Caroline. Yeah, but my mother and father now wouldn't be listening to that. But you said the trawler men. The trawler men would up along the quay. There were three and four deep out along, and uh, it was magic. You had all these beautiful sounds coming along, and um, we were we were enthralled really. Yeah, and it was an education as well, because you were meeting people from a different culture and different part of life that we knew nothing about. And they travelled, they followed the Silver Darlings all around the coast of Ireland back to Scotland. And they were bringing them back in barrels then and they'd pack them and, you know, they'd, they'd be all cured and stuff like that. It was wonderful. A lovely place. And did you ever go off? Did you ever do any fishing yourself? I fish every day of the week with a great friend of mine who was just after going out the door, Jimmy Needham. Jimmy is uh, from Murphy Place like myself. A real episode then, you know. And um, Jimmy and I, we go fishing there. We go for mackerel fishing and pollock and anything else we can get. And the, he, he, the old people had a great skill in filleting mackerel. Jimmy can do it uh, in a way I can't. He actually makes um, uh, like a butterfly shape of the mackerel and there's no bone in it. Now, he had his own way of doing it, but he'd do a box of mackerel in about half an hour. He's absolutely uh, a gifted man. He's from Murphy Place. Uh, he's, he lived in England, he did, and Jersey, and uh, one of the most wonderful characters that you could ever, ever meet. And John, what yeah. was your first job at school? My first job, I was nine when I was in school. Uh, I had to uh, go over to town, load up a horse and cart at nine years of age, and deliver all the milk chair beside before I went into school, right? After that, I came up in the world. <laughs> I got a job as a post boy, and I was a telegram boy, and I was also working for a local company, uh, Colin Maloney's, putting up aerials when TV started first. And then uh, I moved on after that, I worked in a garage, and then I went into the ESB. And I was there for 43 years. And you mentioned uh, your father. Was it your father who worked in the tannery? Michael, he did, yeah. Do you remember going into tannery? Oh, yes. There was uh, an odour from that place there. Uh, they used a lot of chemicals in there, right? It was a magical place. There were these big, huge drums. And all the hides were going around in this chemical uh, stew, right? And it was a place that people worked very hard. 
and the, the, the tanning was done there and the whole lot, the t- the, it was a dangerous place as well. Two men lost their arms down there. And my father often told me there that uh, the screams of those poor men when they got caught in the ripping machine, that it was horrendous. He stayed with them for years, like, you know. Um, it was, a, a, I'll tell you one thing about it. They had the most wonderful children's Christmas party ever at Christmas, right? And we all got a little box of uh, dairy milk, or milk tray, dairy milk, and Santy came. Now, we were very, very, very uh, humble people from Abbeyside. But to us, it was the pinnacle of our year, going to the uh, letter factory Christmas party. And the other big employer was the uh, Clarkie or the... Uh, the Creamery, yeah. We, uh, the Creamery was a massive uh, concern. And in actual fact, um, it was one of the best employers in the whole area, really, because uh, like they had branches all over the county. And they produced butter, and they produced some of the most wonderful stuff you ever saw, just called chocolate crumb. And certain individuals were working in the factory and uh, bits of it used break and they'd bring us home a bit. Now you'd have to break it off an edge, uh, like a footpath or a wall, to break it like that and you could keep soaking away at that for an awful long time. It was heaven. Now, you know. And uh, the third thing I know is that you do have a bit of uh, Irish. I do, yeah. Now, what, tell us about the relationship between Dungarvan and Abbeyside with the Irish language, because obviously Ring is at the old, old parish. Yeah. But there seems to be a kind of interesting relationship between the town and... Well, th- there is, and I, I'll explain to you why. Um, you see, uh, the Irish language was nearly gone, right, OK? Um, <clears throat> it was only a f- small number of people that kept it going alive. In actual fact, Dan Fryer, who I told you about a while ago, he actually had Irish classes down in a cellar when it wasn't very popular to be teaching Irish. But thanks to idea, you know, on Tonga Biofos, and uh, he, they kept it alive, a small nucleus of people, very, very good people, and they kind of kept the culture going as well. And you had it in music. You had, uh, like, people with the old uh, violins and the boxes, and they kept all the tunes alive, and they were retained down through the generations. And you have some of the most wonderful musicians from this area here. Uh, one in particular is from Ring, actually, Donica Goff from Danu. Like, we have so many people, I could keep naming them, Matty Fahey, Nicky Power. You know, um, they're all famous in their own right, but they, all those families have retained that pool of culture and music and language and history and stuff like that, you know. And speaking of history, you're, you're a bit of an uh, authority on different parts of history. I know you brought along some pictures and stuff for us today, so why don't you just talk your way through a few of these Okay. Now, um, I have the actual notice here for a reward during the famine. Uh, a local landlord called Walsh, he was murdered on his way out to Old Parish. And he was after evicting 10 or 11 families in the locality that day. And the assailants were waiting for him about a mile away from his own house. And in actual fact, he was so badly mutilated that uh, his jaws was broken in, his skull was broken in. Nobody, his horse ran home on his own and his trap. Nobody was ever apprehended for the, the act. And this is the actual um, list of subscribers for the reward. In the middle of the famine, the local landlords put up £984, which would be millions now, you know, near enough to it. Like, you know, some of them put up £100 because the local gentry were becoming now afraid that they were going to be targeted as well. As I said, nobody gave away the game on them. In actual fact, that was... And, and of course, it would be well known, would it? Oh, it would have been at the time, yeah. yeah. And uh, as far as, like, as I say, you know, it's an unusual thing. There's always a flying diamond that somebody gives away the game. Nobody gave away the game. So the authorities, uh, they drew a blank there. In actual fact, they offered £200 uh, pounds as well for um, anyone that would... Uh, to the uh, prosecution and conviction of any person, person harbouring or concealing any of the offenders or aiding their escape from justice, nobody took the bait. 
It's unusual. Because I don't think anywhere in Ireland that happened because that was a huge pile of money. But then if they were caught, they'd have been hung. So people weren't going to uh, do that. Talk to us about this one here. Now, this uh, picture here is, uh, it was Lennon's uh, house long ago. And in, at the back of it, we had a tannery uh, where the car park is now. And they had a wool store there as well. It was Captain Matthew Kiley, the harbour master's house. And in the mid 1860s, there was a bit of a skirmish adjacent to it. And in, uh, Matthew Kiley came out to see what the affray was about. Unfortunately, he became impaled on his own front door by a lancer. So the moral of the story is if there's a row outside your door, don't come out. So that's what happened there, Captain Matthew Kiley. He was the harbour master in Dungarvan at the time. What's right. this one here at the stone? Uh, this is a very interesting one. Um, we mentioned the famine there a while ago. This area here was one of the worst hit places in Ireland. Right? Now, on, in, in this hand here is the actual workhouse. That was built to take 600 inmates. Unfortunately, I have the books from the workhouse. I saved them from rotting. Uh, in July 1851, there was 1,987 people in the main workhouse and there was 1,100 in the auxiliary workhouses. These were stores around the town. People were dying like flies. In actual fact, in Cecily Woodham Smith's book, uh, on the 26th of September, 1846, the people of Clashmore were living on berries and, le and grass and leaves. In actual fact, the... Um, the, they sent out uh, an inspector to see what way things are the countryside. And going up uh, a, hill, a hill outside the town called Strikes Hill, it was the main road to Clashmore. A mother was feeding her baby blades of grass and they huddled together. On the way back, both of them were huddled together and uh, they were dead. These were the things that were happening in the data. In actual fact, out at the back of this hospital here, Father Toomey, T-O-O-M-Y, he used to bless all the corpses, and uh, three times a day they were going out on a cart, all emaciated skeletal remains. But he went out with a horse there, uh, dry, uh, there one day, and the horse was actually bought at the horse fair in uh, Ballyporeen for a fiver. He went out, and Mr. Barn was the name of the man, and he tipped them all into a pit out near the Shanachie Relic of Clay. They say that and he saw a movement. City. There was and the little girl days. became conscious. She was about 14 or 15. And she woke up and she said, No, hurry me, no, hurry me, don't bury me. And he went in among all the bodies and took her out among the tangle of humanity, wrapped her in his coat, brought her home. His own uh, family had died from cholera. He brought her home and she emigrated to America and died in the Bronx, New York, at 72 years of age, literally having come up from the grave. This engraving here was done by the inmates of the workhouse. It's the face of Jesus and Mary. And they actually done it with uh, probably a small piece of metal or something like that. And it's on the wall. Not many people know it's there. And uh, this is a copy of what I picked up there. It was a horrendous place. And just to uh, we say highlight it, my grandmother was born in 1881 which wasn't too long after the famine. And when she uh, was sick in 18, uh, 1962, 63, she said to my mother, don't put me in the poorhouse. Uh, it was in their psyche that once she went in there, there was no return. And the simple reason being, the father was separated from the mother and the boys were separated from the girls. So the whole family unit was dis uh, destroyed, decimated. So it was in their psyche, do not send me to the county home. Now, it was horrendous. Just outside where we are here now, uh, 50 yards from where we're sitting, um, they were exporting grain from this town. And yet the people, there were corpses everywhere. And no help from anyone. But, Buecas Ladea, the Native American Indian tribes came to the rescue of the Irish nation. The Choctaw tribe, they were from Minnesota and Dakota. In actual fact, um, they had got money from the government to relocate. They heard from the Irish emigrants how horrendous things were in Ireland. 
and they donated loads of dollars did it to the Irish nation and what was purchased at the time was uh, Indian corn and when it was cooked the husks tore all the intestines of the people that, uh, that ingested them and uh, done more uh, damage than good but they had done it with a good heart and the, uh, the wrong type of food was bought in actual fact in Middleton there's a huge monument now to those what, yeah. what's this, one here? this one here is um, uh, the bridge uh, beside Bridge or Devonshire Bridge. Uh, the the building now is uh, uh, like a nightclub. Oh, it's and, uh, the, it's uh, the Greenway. Rather than trying to find. So we might have eggs. a shot at that. And also as well where it is now, that was the first cinema in John Garvin, built in 1914. And um, I uh, I always say a picture tells a thousand words. That's a clip, a picture that was taken from a piece of silent movie, an ad, right? But unfortunately, this has tragic consequences. <laughs> this building here is just off the street. Our Miller's Hardware went on fire. And the nanny and the, the young boy, they were uh, burned. The fire brigade couldn't get to them. They had to jump out the top window. That's Miller's. There was a famous fire there, uh, just there uh, around the, uh, the war time. And that's... That's an actual uh, print of a piece of strip of film that was shown in the old cinema. Okay. Right. Okay.